there's no Trump lawn signs. Like even the Trump fans, like he does one event a week. So yeah, they all show up. They'll do a giant rally tonight and a bunch of people show up. It'll look like energy, but he's not been in the state all week. You don't see even the, the energy of the Trump people in 16 and in 20. It's just not there. It's like there's this this kind of acquiescent quality to the whole thing where there's just no energy anywhere. It's like, you know, yeah, there's a bunch of Nikki Haley ads on the air, but no one gives a shit. Everyone is just basically like, we know what's going to happen here. Welcome to a bonus weekend South Carolina primary edition of the Bulwark podcast. I'm Tim Miller. I gathered the whole circus crew for the occasion. We got Jen Palmieri. She was communications director for Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Mark Mcat McKinnon was media advisor to W and McCain. John Heilman, national affairs analyst for NBC News, author of Game Change and Double Down, some other mysterious pursuits. Y'all, it's so great to see you. Most, most of them, the most of them within the bounds of the law. Most. <laughs> most. Mm. Um, we are taping this on Friday afternoon. So there's one, one potential problem with that is that the South Carolina primary hasn't happened yet. And some, some of our good listeners might listen on Sunday or Monday. But the good news is, I, I think we all know what's going to happen. Uh, Haley's going to get <laughs> schlonged by about somewhere between 20 and 45 points. So before... can, we not say sh- can we not say schlonged in this context no. when it's Donald Trump? <laughs> you know, I, I think Barack Obama got in trouble for that once, right? Well, I, I apologize. Well, Nikki yeah. Haley's going to get yeah. beaten decisively between 20 yeah. and 45 points, I think. We can all stipulate that before the convo, right? MCAT, do you, do you want to offer can I give you... a... Yeah, listen, I've, I always thought that there should be something called the Al Gore rule, which is if you're running for president, you should have to win your home state, although Donald Trump changed that equation. But yeah, this, and this is just a testament to just how much the Republican primary has changed that she can't win in her home state. Can I, can I just say one thing, though, about this? I, there was a data point that I just want to inject in this, which is I looked Please. at this today. Donald Trump has never, uh, has not been, has had not had lower than a 20 point lead in South Carolina for the past year. Wow. There's like literally not a poll in one yep. year in which he hasn't been at least he's been between well, 20 and four, a 20 to 40 point lead for a whole year. There's yep. one poll back like like in January of 2023 where he was only had like a 17 point lead and every other poll he's been between he's 20 and 40. No yeah. better time than now. No better time yeah. than present. Okay. So given that. I thought it would be fun to. I gave you homework. I assume Heilman didn't do it, but we're gonna st- we're gonna start with him first. I did. You it. did. Yeah. No, you did I'm great. First. And the, I'm the, first. you want to go first? Okay, MCAT wants to go first. The homework was uh, was if we had a circus this week, what would the show be called? And and do you have a theme song for it? You get bonus. You get bonus grade points if you had a. Theme I have song. a theme and a song, and they're the same. Carolina in my mind, James Taylor. Oh, no. Okay. It's too obvious. A little it's a different you know, Carolina. That, North Carolina. Is that no. right? The James, was the James Taylor. Taylor the, about? You're, North you're, Carolina. North Carolina. But, yeah, you know. Yeah. Anyway. It's, I didn't know about the song. I got to, like, do some thinking <laughs> okay, about that. Okay. You can go last. You have time to think about it. Heilman? Thank you. I think that uh, – that that Jen Palmieri will definitely remember this. Mark McKinnon will definitely remember this. You, Tim, as a student of history may remember this, although you're too young to have experienced it. But at the end of the, of the, at the end of the 1996 presidential campaign, when, uh, when Bill Clinton with all of his problems was spanking Bob Dole, there got to be a period in the last like week or so when Dole was just so, uh, there, there, there were two things about the end of that campaign that were great. One was at the end of long of the day at like five o'clock, whenever you were out on the road, Dole would cut his speech off at a certain moment. And because of the time that they had the, for the curfew at National Airport, he would go, I'm sorry, this speech is now over. National, here we come. And he'd run to the bus because he was just like, <laughs> I'm done with that, done with this shit. I'm not going to have to stay in this, in this place where I am. The other thing was he would, he would just burst out. He had these outbursts uh, all the time. He would say, where is the outrage? Where is the outrage? Where is the outrage would be my episode title because if you if you think about what's the things that Trump has done and said in any other era in a, in a South Carolina primary, you know, a South Carolina that is dominated by veterans and and you know has been the idea that you know Donald Trump sucking up to Vladimir Putin, not saying uh, boo about about Navalny's. Uh, assassination, be, uh, trashing Nikki Haley's husband, who's an actively deployed military person. There'll be out. I mean, you know, he, he has Getting just been helped an, he, by a spy, apparently. Yes. A Russian spy. He has been a nonstop uh, uh, flood of, of, of self aggrandizing Putin stroking gibberish uh, and, and, and perfidy. And yet no one gives a fuck in South Carolina. It doesn't give a fuck. Nothing's changing in that race. She's hitting him harder. Uh, 
uh, and trying to gin up the outrage and is getting nowhere. There's no traction for it whatsoever. And uh, so that's where's the outrage would be my my episode title and my theme song for it would be Tim, this is right for you for reasons you'll understand in a moment uh, would be a classic song about the Pet Shop Boys called Being Boring which is pretty much just pretty much describes the entire Republican primary. I could give that that'd be a half season uh, or overarching so- theme song. Yeah. So boring. With it, could you imagine Being doing this boring. show every week? Oh. What are you going to talk about? Uh, it's, the right, fla- it's the most flaccid, lifeless, uh, sad, deflated uh, presidential campaign I've ever seen, covered, or hoped to ever witness again in my life. It is fair, though. I could just before I get to you, Janet, it is fair. like the where yeah. is the outrage is fair. And this is a very bulwarky pick. Um, so it also fits for this podcast. Where is the outrage? Because we're, because it's it is hard to really kind of imagine that everyone has just gotten in line and when i think about that episode title i would point it more towards you know the kind of republican establishment figures that just gave in right this yep. time you know uh, you have that your tim scott and you can remember the south Carolina primary of 16 we have marco and haley and scott all campaigning together i mean it, they could have at least tried to try you know, in the last week, Mike Gallagher just quit Congress. I mean, like the types of people that should be outraged are just either giving in or giving up. It's By the way, I have a real, I have a real uh, vision of that primary um, and a spectacularly visual evening when uh, Haley endorsed Rubio uh, there. And it was so cinematic and they look, both looked so young and energetic. And I just thought, man, if this is the face of the Republican Party, look out. It was before his ears got so big. Every every single major Republican elected official in South Carolina, except I think one congressman, right, um, is 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 backing uh, Trump. Yeah, and Ralph Norman, just, who's an insurrectionist, who's an insurrectionist, yeah, who somehow is still with Haley. I don't really understand that. That's one of the great mysteries of our time. But it's amazing that the whole South Carolina political establishment is just behind Trump, and it does, and they don't. I mean, I'm standing out there by the USS Yorktown, looking at, I'm thinking about all the events I've been to with Republican candidates on that, on that and they, all of them, because it's all about the military there. It's all veterans, active duty military. Right, that's where John Kerry announced his president. He his did. Campaign. That's, yeah. that's that's exactly right. But Republicans just always go there. Like every Republican, Ted Cruz, uh, um, Rand Paul announced his campaign there, you know, Newt Gingrich, Rick Santorum, they all do events out there. It's like the most trafficked venue in the state. For this good reason, it's the one of the most great, one of the most military states in the in the country, and and Trump has just been like just shitting on the military in every way imaginable, and no one cares. No, I mean, except for the people who already cared, the people who are already against Trump. They're they're all average, but you know, yeah, but I mean, thirty percent of the electorate cares. It's not nothing. Thirty yeah. percent of the Republican electorate. But I mean, those people that had already decided that those are the people who are going to be who are going to be against Trump. The anti-Trump part of the party is is outraged. But no one else yeah. is. No one, no persuadable vote. It's not moving any votes around, right? right. Again, to the point right. of his giant lead in that state, he's made it. He's done the things that would normally be catastrophic um, in South Carolina, and not a, not a. There's no even a flutter in the numbers. You know. All right, Jen. I saw you scroll on your Spotify. Oh yeah, I did. I figured something. it out. Yeah. So my the, my title. So I think what's important this week is that it did. It felt it felt like this was the week that Russia really broke through. Right. It like came full circle from 2016, where uh, the House leadership, the Big Four, right, uh, uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Senate Minority Leader, House Speaker, and House Minority Leader were all briefed on Russia interfering in the election prior to Labor Day. The administration wanted to make it public. Mitch McConnell said no. Um, to this week where you have Navalny killed, you have the Shmirnov, uh, the, you have the Repu- House Republicans have now gone, not got, now gone from being skeptical about intelligence from eight years ago to now passing on Russian intelligence to try to impeach the sitting president of the United States. So my title is going to be Shmirnov Smash, which is their new vodka seltzer. <laughs> um, and my song, which as you know, I just came up with because I just looked, you know, scrolled now, uh, is Sweet Tea, uh, keeping with the ve- beverage theme, which is a Craven Melon song. And they, unlike James Taylor, are from South Carolina. Ooh. It's pretty good. That was pretty a good. South Carolina for like... poll. Great. Uh, that yeah. is really great. <laughs> That's a great on the fly poll. Wow. Um, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Just... That, that is good. The Russian thing is, I, MCAT, where do you have you have, have you lost the ability to be outraged? I'm tying their last two questions together. Like it is the Smirnoff thing has had me in a state all week. I mean, it's it's pretty insane that the House Republicans are literally <laughs> passing along fake Russian disinfo. Where where, where are you at on that? Well, yeah, I'm 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 in full Bob Dole mode. 
<laughs> I mean, where is the goddamn outrage? It's incredible. But on on the topic of South Carolina, man, I just talk about a river of memories, you know, for all of us. I know just epic campaigns that that were so significant and uh, and determinative, and you know, comebacks, um, you know, rallies. And this thing is just kind of petering out in a way that kind of, you know, flushes all those. Memories. It goes to the being boring that, that Hallman said. What, so you, which side were you at on, on O.O. McCain and Bush? I mean, this, that is the prime. Bill oh, Bush. He was involved in the, in the destruction of John McCain's uh, political Do you remember uh, the drunk debates? The, the debates where people were drinking? Oh yeah, I yes. Like oh, yeah, because because South Carolina used to be you used to be able to get used to be able to drink when they had those debates at Myrtle Beach. The Republican yeah. crowds would always be drunk as fuck, and they'd be like <laughs> screaming. There was no uh, restraint on the audience. There was a the the one in in 2012, the Gingrich one, where CNN asked about yeah. his extramarital affairs in 2012. That was like everyone was drunk there in Charleston. I remember, like people were, the, and the Myrtle Beach debates were always like everyone was everyone was rowdy and shit faced at those debates. Those were really fun. I was screaming. Both of my two presidential campaigns ended in South Carolina, Palmetto yeah. State, which would have been a, your good Jason Isbell alt alternative pick for you, Jen. But yeah, I, uh, I, I how got did to have I not a... think of that. I, know. I, oh, I assumed it was going to be. I assumed yeah, we I'm going to go rose. see him tomorrow. I'm going to see him tomorrow night. Radio City Music Hall. Here's here's the thing. Here's this thing though that I I just that it's had me spend a week there. This goes to MCAT's point, you know, which is, and it's true, obviously, on the Democratic side too. You go through Iowa, nice. And then you have this New Hampshire, you know, at both of the, they're basically, they're basically, they're, they're basically kind of like gloves off states. They don't really get, you know, they're not down and dirty. Right. And the thing about South Carolina in both the Democratic and Republican side is you would get down there and it was always a brawl and there yeah, was the a lot of dirty chains. Uh, yeah. Right. The, like the big, big red dogs off the leash. Right. And, and it was like, you know, <laughs> dirty politics and, and Democrats and Republicans alike, a lot of like nastiness and the mailing the mailers on the car windows and the the, the radio the radio ads and the and it was like it was it was appalling sometimes but always like electric and fun you know like there was just a lot of energy there you know and and they were also often in the republican side decisive as you know somebody pointed out south carolina primary invented in 1980 everybody who has everybody but newt gingrich who's won the primary has gone on to win the nomination so it's like in some ways the decisive primary for republican side and being there for five days this week i it was if i any i couldn't believe that it could anything could be more desultory than iowa new hampshire this year but it was just it was like low energy jeb had taken over the state <laughs> there's like no there's not even there's no trump the lawn, lawn there's no trump lawn signs like even the trump fans like he does one event a week so yeah they all show up they'll do a giant rally tonight and a bunch of people show up it look like energy but he's not been in the state all week i mean he's not he flew in for the laura thing it's the only other event he's done all week so it's like you don't see even the, the energy of the Trump people in 16 and in 20. It's just not there. It's like there's this this kind of acquiescent quality to the whole thing where there's just no energy anywhere. It's like, you know, yeah, there's a bunch of Nikki Haley ads on the air, but no one gives a shit. Everyone is just basically like, we know what's going to happen here, you know, and, and I think broadly that's how the country is about the whole race, which is sort of like. We don't love the idea of Biden and Trump. And I think it's, it's we don't want to see. Yeah. And it's and, and it is I think it's overstated. You know, the the thing that gets missed, a lot of people say the Democrats aren't super psyched about Biden. And there obviously are a lot of questions about Biden among a lot of voters. But I just even on the Trump side, you know, he's got his hardcore base. that are really nuts. But there's a big chunk of the Republican Party that's sort of like, yeah, he seems inevitable. I'll, I like him better than Biden, but they're not like really. You know, they're not anti, but they're not really pro. You know, there's at least a third of the parties like that. And man, it just makes for a really dissolute kind of like, you know, everyone's just sort of shrugging their shoulders and walking around, which is not a lot of fun. Did you make it to the Meatball Ron event in South Carolina <gasps> while you were down there? Wait, did he go? Sad, he had one sad event in South Carolina Why? this week. I was kind of like trying to stay in the mix. <laughs> you know? uh, Who was he campaigning for? <laughs> Uh, neither of them. It was like a issue based, you know, one of those groups. I think that had invited to him to an event, but when he, uh, when he, was Tim, I want you race, to, to go I want you to, I want you to say That's this, this sad. phrase again. Did I go to a meatball Ron issues based event where he was campaigning for no one? He went there to it talk about. It seems like issues. you were bored. It seems like you were bored. Mean, Maybe that sounded yes, entertaining. Yes, on a uh, kind of on, on a phone call that got leaked out that he once again was trashing Trump and yeah, 
Yeah, there's a Zoom call with his delegates where he was. He said he, he wouldn't didn't want to be VP, and then it really has been the most heated exchange of the whole week has been like La Savita, uh Trump's campaign manager, tweet yeah, dunking on Ron DeSantis, who's not even in the race on Twitter. That shows you how how weak it's been. What was like the Haley event like though, John? I mean, he said it's quiet. Like, what? Who are there? We're, like when you're talking to people, is it Democrats that are there? Like, it's, who's there? Honestly, I'll, I'll say something that like not not that many Democrats. You know what it is? Is it it reminded me. Of, <laughs> It's like a little bit John like John, to John Huntsman crowd. <laughs> Honest to God. Yeah. We're doing a great job. Like, here, Tim. You know, it, <laughs> By the way, it's a lot of people. That last South Carolina wind down. I yeah, they're, I they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, it's upscale. You know, she's, she's got in that, in that, in the low country and along the coast where she's going to overperform relative to the rest of the state, you know, and where her lot, some of her money, there's a bunch of, she got a bunch of wealthy backers down there who are still going to keep funding the campaign going forward. There's a little more enthusiasm for her there, but you know, the events are basically, you know, a couple hundred people, you know, if she gets 500, it's a big event and they're, it's, they're not, it's not like they're lifeless and dead, but they're, they're very, uh, they're very dockers and and polo shirt kind of like that that sort of you know yeah. that that kind of 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 the part of south carolina south carolina is a very diverse uh, uh, income wise culturally and and economically very kind of diverse state you can run all kinds of all kinds of there's redneck parts of that state and there's very upscale parts that say investment yeah. bankers and and he, he, she's got the upscale that's her thing she's 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 living in in the space where, uh, like the Bill Bradley voter of the Republican party, you know, that's like, those are the kind of people who are there and they're, and they're perfectly pleasant, but they're all, they all know they're kind of there to show her support, but I, they, they know as well as everybody else that she doesn't have a chance. Like in virtue, you have like con- they're like, yeah, they're like, we're here to support Nikki because we think it's important. She's in this race, but they're not like, nobody's deluded. Yeah. that They think she's going to win. Well, um, I didn't get to give you guys my title. Do you want it? So you can oh, yes. what you think. 100%. Okay. Um, I, I, I've been thinking about it. I came up with a pun. I know Holloman likes puns, which was last rights. And my last rights of this was, I tried to make it about broader, and it's about Nikki, of course. But I really think that like the Nikki Haley Bush party has been on, in hospice for kind of a while now. But like she was the best next representative of it, really, like that that could potentially be up and coming. And for her to go to her home state and lose by whatever, 25 points, it's maybe the official end. Death. We can do a time of death for the Bush party. Yeah, Jimmy Carter's uh, been in hospice for a year. Give us, give her a little more time. You give her a little That's more true. time. What, what do we think? McKinnon, Jen, is it a death of that party or could it could it come back? Can we put the gravestone on it? Well, I'm all for her plugging away. Just as long as she's got money and can put any gas in the tank, just fly the flag, just say we're still here. I mean, I know we're on an island and there's a few survivors left, but it's important to send the message. And, you know, I mean, uh, our friend James Carville, as you recall in the last episode of our last show, said the era of strategic certainty is over. And and that may be the only true thing about this election. And who knows what the hell is going to happen? I just think being the last person standing, and even if you've got 13 delegates, who knows? Jen, is it dead? Is it R? Is it R I G H T or R R I T E S? Because R I G H T, yeah, that, that also with the you know nearby state of Alabama. That's the that, whole thing. That's the whole thing with puns is that they could you could spell me. That's where our editors do the backup yeah. and do it yeah. over again. Yeah, Divya oh, could yeah, decide. Oh yeah, do a little curse. Divya mm-hmm. would curse. Yeah, she would like have the cursor back up with that. Um, I feel like it's been gone for a while. It's just going to morph into something else, right? It's just like, so I don't know if it's the end of anything because it's, I feel like that, that, that 30% hasn't know where to go. I think it is good that she's staying in, even if she stays in all the way to the convention, just because having a Republican make those arguments against Trump is like really helpful, even with just de- riling up Democrats or, or, or independents. I just, yeah, I'm just not sure what those people are going to become. What no, you are don't. you, Tim? You're one yeah. of those people. What are you? It's over. For, I mean, it's over for me. I think. Are you? I, think, I know, well, but are you, a, yeah. are you a Democrat now? No. I mean, I, so the only Republican I voted for since 2016 uh, is a guy named mm-hmm. Stephen Wagspack, who ran in Louisiana in the first in the first round, who had no chance to win. So Does, I he one, Does he have a yeah, monocle? Does he have a monocle? Exactly. I voted for one hopeless man <laughs> with a monocle, <laughs> a monocle. In, the, in, in the first round. So you tell me what I am. I mean, am I a Democrat? Like, I don't know. You know, you could, if I lived in Maryland. There are a handful of states left where I might have voted for a Republican, but I, I think that, and I think that a lot of these people are your Brian Kemp. Some of them are swing voters. They're your Kemp Warnock voter. 
Um, but some of them are practically Democrats now, functionally Democrats. Well, here's an interesting little yeah. data point, which, and you think about, you know, the party and who's part of it and what is it in the future. Yeah. And, and I w I've been looking, uh, thinking about Gen Z voters for a, a little project I'm thinking about. And, uh, and you know, I was thinking about the, you know, the, obviously the, the Biden Gen Z voters and, and the split and the Democratic Party and all that. And I thought about you know, Trump Gen Z voters, but I was trying to think about anti-Trump Gen Z voters. There's no anti-Trump Gen Z voters. If you're Gen Z, you're either Trump or you're not. Right. There's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is if right. You're, right. If you're a Gen Z Republican, you're Trump. There's yeah. no, so, let me, they don't know any I, other party. Let, let me ask you this question. They don't Tim. know any other party. Yeah. Tim and, and Mark, both of you guys could, could, could deal with this. It seems to me like, so like the, here's the, the counter thing on Haley. Which, uh, which I was part of the, the reason I put this in the, this piece I did for Morning Joe today because Dick Harpoolian, who's a Democrat, but was smart about this and just laid out a theory, right? And the theory was, you know, sh she stays in the race and there is a chunk of the party that's still in either hostile to Trump or kind of indifferent and people, you know, people's actual political commitments are way overstated by all of us. Like, you know, there, these, there's these stories about the the anti-Trump college voters who, you know, got upset about the insurrection and now they're back with Trump. It's like people, like most people in America don't give a fuck about politics enough. And they, they, they could change a lot over the course of the next eight years once Trump is gone. And his kind of thesis was if, if she's right that he's going to lose when it's over, she's going to have been out there, uh, gone to a lot of States, been out on the stump in a lot of places. She's always been good at raising money. She's going to be out there, not just, but just, just, but this get this gets to a question, which I'm trying to get to, which is not his thing is like Trump is gone now. The party's up for grabs. There's going to be you know a bunch of people contesting for leadership of it and what it actually is. And I think his point was not well. Nikki Haley's obviously going to be the next standard bearer. Her point was more kind of like it puts her in the conversation around where does the party go, and she's going to be a familiar face who's going to be able to say, "I told you so." And like, I was right. You were wrong. He like, fucked us again. We lost again. And, and, and I guess my, what that is premised on is this notion that, at, that after Trump, that there will be a big conversation about the future of what was once you guys were both attached to the Republican party. Do you think that's true? Or do no. you think after Trump, the Trumpism just marches on? I, 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 you know, I'm inviting you to speculate. You know, I don't like speculation, but I'll invite you both yeah. to speculate well, because I that's think, an interesting question. I think MCAT will maybe be more optimistic than me as is his nature. So we'll see if not, but I'll go first briefly. I just think I, if you said to me, hi, I'm John Heilman from the future. I've, I've, I've come in a time machine and, and it's 2032 and the Republican nominee in 2032 is one of these three people, Nikki Haley, Matt Gates, or Tucker Carlson. I'll tell you that Nikki would be by far my third choice in that draft on the most likely person for it to be. I, I don't know that it will necessarily be somebody like Gates either, but it's just. I, I don't, is that I just gut a, or is that based on a, is that just no, gut or based, based on, on a, an no, assessment it's, of. It's, a, it's based on assessment of what MCAT was talking about, about Gen Z and younger voters, an assessment about who has checked into the party versus who has checked out. I mean, I think Dick Harpoolian talking to a lot of people who. Are, are not really representative of what the real and older voter is. Yeah, yeah they're older, older people older. who are kind of vestigial Republicans. That are still it's part of their identity. But if you've in the last ten years, if you've said, "Oh, I'm a Republican now," you like Trump or something like it, right? Maybe it'll be a softer version. Maybe it won't be quite as crazy or quite as deranged or orange or whatever. But you want something kind of like it. You don't want Nikki. You were a Democrat when Ni the Nikki type of Republicans were in charge. And then if you're the type of person that likes Nikki. Many of them, we t when you talk about how people don't have these political uh, attachments as strong as we think, I think that's true. And I think there are a lot of people just looking at my friend group from high school who all voted for W and all voted for Biden with one or two ex exceptions who don't listen to the fucking Bulwark podcast, even though I beg them to. None of them <laughs> like none of them had big identity crises about this. They just vote, they were for George W. Bush and they were for Romney. And then one day they're like, guess not. I guess I'm for Joe Biden and, now. And and there are a lot of those folks out there, too. So the makeup of the party, I think, has just changed too permanently for her. I, I, I would love to be wrong. I've been wrong a lot, but that's just my, my how I would project it. MCAT, do you have a more any more optimistic? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a rosier version. It doesn't surprise you. I, I think that there is a, a real chance that that uh, tr Trump loses, and then he will have lost in 20, 22, 24. 
and that uh, don't forget uh, 18. 18, yeah. 18 uh, and and lost the the House, the Senate, and the presidency for the first time in 100 years since Grover Cleveland, and that some they might start to finally get a clue that maybe this formula isn't working. I also don't think that. I mean, I think Bannon is, you know, uh, I think he's right about a lot about just kind of it being a movement and, and it could move on past Trump. But I also think that Trump is such a unique, singular figure that I don't think anybody else is going to be able to carry that standard forward. And if I, I've always thought we're, it's going to have the party's going to have to be burned down and resurrected from the ashes. And the two questions, what comes up from that? And Nikki Haley at that point will have, uh, you know, some really good notches in her in her belt. You know, she will have, you know, uh, gone through this process as the second person standing and raised a ton of money, uh, run a pretty good campaign, gained a lot of credibility. And despite what Don Lemon says, she will not be way past her prime. She'll be, she'll be 50. Don catching strays. Wow. Um, um, You know, but the thing is that the, the person who finishes second always thinks that they can be the next, uh, person who finishes first and they're not they're just the person who came in second the last time around you <laughs> yeah. know like well it's funny it used to be in the Re- in the republican party it used to be that used to be true it's just you know trump just blew all that up right i mean you know you know romney and romney true for romney i guess it was true, it was for, true romney. for mccain it was, for... it was true for romney but i was but true. i think that, then, yeah I think that that's true you're right you're right, you're right. If he loses, and I think you know Republicans among the thing of the messages of the beginning is that maybe we should nominate a woman, and Nikki's been through this drill, and she's she's, she's a proven warrior. Yeah, but it's like if they're going to reject Trump, it's like I think you're going to have to have somebody who had no connection to him. You know, she was his ambassador to the UN. She propped him up. She propped him up when it when he needed it. I think like you know, bring on like I don't know, like and she David still Holt says- from Oklahoma. Oklahoma City or All somebody. Right. That's my you know. boy, David Holt. All right. Is You're really right? pandering. I mean, You're pandering to the Bulwark crowd now. David Holt, oh, the last, I did remaining, not know the last that. remaining Bulwark Republican, <laughs> Oklahoma City mayor. He just seems, uh, uh, he seems good. Like, you know, he, he's like a problem solver. You know, um, like, you said one thing by about, the way, she, one by the way, she still says she's going to pardon him. She still says she's going to pardon him yeah. if she gets uh, if she, yeah. if she were president. I need Ooh. to get Jen's opinion about the Biden yeah. discourse, but I have one more thing about Haley first before yeah. we, we lose everybody. You said on Morning Joe, that you, I think, someone told me this, so I haven't actually seen it. So it could, this is a game of telephone. Um, something about Nikki, maybe third party, maybe that there could be a no labelsy thing. There's some buzz about that. What's your, what was that? What was the I context said, of that? I said that there was, I think what I said was that there was, that there had been, the way that she's handled that, there, there's been speculation about it. And that's true. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. like the, there's been a, I don't believe that that's true, but there has been speculation about it. And there's speculation because she's been asked about it. And she keeps saying very, very self-consciously, I'm not thinking about that right now. I've given no thought to that. What I'm pursuing right now is the Republican nomination, which is like the kind of thing that people say when they want to leave the door open to it. Right. I would say, you know, that if you believe Nikki Haley is, is, and I say this, Jen, not in a, in a loaded gender way. I think, as you know, I think most politicians are highly ambitious creatures, but she's very ambitious. And a lot of people think she's calculating. And part of the reason she's been ideologically so all over the place is because she's constantly tacking from one thing to another in terms of what her perceived advantage is at that moment. That, that you know, that you look at no labels and you say, um, uh, I'm, you know, the no labels candidate is not going to be president in 2024. It's not going to win. And and the no labels candidate is not going to be, then is not going to become the Republican candidate if they become first the no labels candidate. And so there's no way if you think you want to be the leader of the Republican party in some reconstituted thing, if that's what you're playing the long game, or if you're playing the short game and you want to be president, being the no labels candidate is not the way to do that. And so it's, it's not, I think, where she ends up. There is one alternative view of this, which is that being the no labels candidate, if you decided that what you want to do is make money. And like corporate boards was your play. You're going to leave politics to the end of this. Like going to do the no labels thing would be a great credential to go and be, to connect to a lot of rich donors. She's pretty I'm, I'm again, I'm just saying, I'm saying very yeah. people, people look at her financial motivations. That's another prism that you get from the South Carolina people. They're like very financially motivated. If she decided that what she wanted was a pathway to corporate boards, that would open up that like, you're basically, I'm giving up politics. I'm just going to do this because that is obviously what, you know, a lot of the no labels Support it comes from you know that kind of crowd, the corporate, the crowd, and the people who have a lot of connections to corporate boards. I don't think that's what she's doing, but but I I just give you the that's I'll give you the whole that's the whole that's the whole discussion around Nikki and 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 no labels. Any disagreements, Cat? What do you think? Well, I I think it's unlikely that she would uh, go that route, um, ex- with the exception that. If, if she made a calculation that 
there really was no future beyond Trump, but that, that Trump is the future of the Republican Party, whether he wins or loses that and that she's that she's she, you know, she burned her ship on the shore and she can't go back and that there's no route forward in the Republican Party. I think it would I think she'd look at it and, and it would make sense for and, and, and by the way, I think a, a Haley led third party ticket could be trouble. I mean, and I, think I, I will say I will say that if you listen to the speech she gave when she said she wasn't going to drop out, if you listen to what she actually said, you were the if you were the the Martian from the future or whatever, Tim, and you just landed and you said, okay, what is this person angling for? Her denunciation of Trump and Biden is equal. I mean, she does she is a no labels message right now, which is you know the country doesn't want either one of these people. Biden's too far to the left, Trump's too far to the right. They're totally divisive. We need to have unity. I need their need. I mean, she's. She's giving a speech that a no labels candidate could give if you just listen to the speech itself on the substance. So I think that's part of what's fueled some people's thinking about this is that she is in the no labels slot. That's what she's that's the message she's running on right now. Yeah, I'm I, I'm surprised nobody's pulled it. I'm surprised nobody's pulled it. And as, as MCAT knows, we've gone round and round on this because I'm pretty. Yeah, I'm pretty hostile. I've been hostile to no labels. because I think most of the candidates have been floated. I look at them and say, and eh, these these people are mostly going to take from Biden. The Haley case is interesting in that, you know, if she, you'd say that she, if you think about it, she is a third of the party, you know, or, you know, third, 30 percent of the vote, you know, probably five to 10 percent of those people max are gettable for Biden. And then there's another 20 percent that are more rank and file traditional Republicans. She might. I don't know. I, I guess all I'm saying is unknown. I don't know. She might hurt Biden, too. But I think it's, it'd be more interesting than the other names out there as far as conceivably right. pulling from Trump. Most of the no labels people are people who would hurt Biden unequivocally, and and she was one who you'd have to at least think it through. It's not it's not obvious that she might you know hurt. She she could conceivably take away more Republican votes than Democrat votes. That's right. That makes sense to me. Um, Be interesting. Jen I wonder if the, I wonder if I wonder if the Biden and Trump people are pulling it. I yeah. bet they are. Well, if, we, you know, if, you, if you're credit, listening and you have that, leak it to us. What? To their credit, I will I will just say here I'll, 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 candidly that I, as as you know, and I say repeatedly, I have no official role of no labels and haven't in a long time. But I do call and talk to him occasionally, and and I I ask that question. I said, well, have you polled uh, Nikki Haley? And, and to their credit, that that we don't poll. That's not you know we're, we're, we don't do that. That's not. No, of course they don't know. poll. They're going to decide themselves. Oh. <laughs> like it's okay, like, it's we're like not going there. People are going to decide. This, this podcast is not going to end up in a DOJ report. The system that produces the two geriatrics. I don't know. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good. Ta- that's a good bar you got there, Tim. Uh, yeah, I do not want to end up in a DOJ complaint on this podcast. Okay, Jen. Uh, if we had this show last week, you know, I think that the, the golden goose would have been Jen and Ezra Klein sitting down. I don't know in Brooklyn somewhere. Boy, I don't know. Oh I'm trying to picture this. Like, you know, what, what, how do you think that conversation play, would have played out? I was, I don't know if you know, do you know that I had, that I wrote a response, a very yeah. polite response to yeah. Ezra Klein. Yeah. I, did, I wrote a, I wrote, I wrote a very reply, polite response for Ezra. I mean, it is, and I have to say, I think Ezra Klein really helped. Uh, it, it, he helped Democrats. He helped, he helped Biden because it's just, you know, if you if you talk to someone who for five seconds who had ever worked on a presidential campaign, you would understand why it is bonkers to think that like the great move now when you have one hundred and thirty million dollars that a presidential campaign is sitting on and or in building organizations in uh, in battleground states that you should wait until the middle of August, like put the one hundred and thirty million dollars aside, not build any kind of coordinated organization and then like hope that you're divided uh that, that after your pre- your sitting president admits defeat by resigning or saying he's not going to run, that you can you know resurrect some kind of strong campaign to take on Donald Trump with eleven weeks to go. It's right, just right. it's just ridiculous. So I think that so he has especially since the record of broker conventions producing uh, producing uh, 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 successful nominees is uh, uh, like like somebody please point to the last time that uh, Lincoln we got it worked for Lincoln. Back to Lincoln. Bill Crystal pointed I, that out this week. Well, Abe Ezra. Ezra, I believe, also pointed that out. I, w- I would just say it's like the people are like, it'll be exciting television. I'm like, yeah. Oh, you, anybody watch the, anybody watch the 68? Anybody watch the 68 convention oh, in Chicago? Yeah. That was exciting. Yeah. Too. Jamal, yeah. Jamal yeah. Bowman yeah. charging the stage yeah. with sure. some pro Hamas protesters is going to be oh my wild. God. While Josh Shapiro oh tries to take the nomination God. from the first black vice president, that's all going to go real great. <laughs> and that's another, be another, another, another police, another police riot in Grant Park. Yeah, that'll be great. 
Oh. Yeah. So I think so it has helped. And then the, the other thing I feel like in the last 10 days since the her report now the her report, you know, some people are like, oh, this is good. They got the Biden campaign got their crucible over early. It's like, well, no, that just showed you like how bad it's going to get when his vulnerability around his age comes into like the crosshairs, right? It's tough, but at least we, they like got through that. And I think they are definitely, he is out more. He's also more relevant right now because he's in an actual fight with Trump. So you see more of him. I think seeing more of him, even when he screws up is important because we understand like, Oh, he knows what's going on. He like, you know, he's a, he, he talks to the, he talks to the press most days. He does Q and A, Q and A's with the press on most days this doesn't actually necessarily get covered so i think it is it's it just feels like it feels a little it feels stabilized jennifer i'll I'll just say completely anecdotally that just in the last week or two i feel like i've heard and seen biden more a lot yeah in a good way you know it's just like oh right he's out there and it wasn't you know some very it was just like something sort of normal it's like oh he's normal and he can do that yeah he does he, you know he walks up and talks to the press on most days and that is and i think partly it's he's getting covered more because it's like you know russia and ukraine and you know seeing navalny's widow and um the jokes about his all, sex life that was good all three of you all jokes three of about you guys, his sex life all three of you guys know what it's like because you've all been involved in managing campaigns and dealing with 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 communications if you if somebody says to you something that's that I think in this case is unequivocally true, but if you heard this and you were running the communications operation for for for, for Joe Biden, you would be like, oh, oh, oh. it's like the reality is you've got to normalize his mistakes. They have to become they have to become yes. out of the mill. The only way for this to work, he's going to be making mistakes. He's going to be looking old. He's going to be doing shit. He's going to make mix stuff up. He's going to make mistakes for the rest of the campaign. If you make it. You have to make it like he makes them every day and people see it and it's fine and it's because okay. it's just, That's if you really make it, it because of it, because it becomes isolated things where every time yeah. he makes a mistake, people can focus on it. I would like flood the zone with Biden. I'd like be like, get it. It's a huge risky thing to do, but like the only way you can survive this is to make it so that when he makes the mistakes, people shrug as opposed yeah. to yeah. because they're like, the oh, that's still, Joe. There you go. Oh, it's Joe. He does that. Yeah. Yeah. Even grandpa Joe, it's fine. He's still, but the ship of state's still floating and, you know, the economy's yeah. still getting better and we're still- He's still putting, holding NATO to get that together. And, and we're like, putting sanctions on- so we to call it NATO. We're putting sanctions on Putin <laughs> and he's meeting with Navalny's widow and he's doing all that stuff. And so yeah. he yeah. fucks some shit up every day. Like, big deal. Move on. He'll be more like Trump fun. then, where like people just write off all of Trump's lunacy yeah. because it's all so normalized. You got to get there and it's going to be painful. There is an asymmetry on the attacks though. Trump uh, on Truth Today had a little meme up there where it's like Biden is, is shuffling and then he goes into you know that that old folks home commercial visiting angels <laughs> like I trump is it. trump is posting this on on his social media biden's campaign like you know has the has just the decorum to not do that right so that yeah. I, I worry about it. i don't know if people are ready for that like the the just the low blow TikTok yeah, 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 Biden yeah, attacks yeah, yeah, yeah. are going to yeah, be I know, just I know. off the. They're, I mean, they're going to be. They're brutal. I mean, if you look on they're TikTok, already out they're, there, Biden, they're brutal. Yeah, they're, they're already are, out yeah. there. If somebody said to me they went and spent some time where they just went and just went on TikTok and searched for Biden content, just just to see like what, just just to do the deep dive of just like what's what's out there and like what are young people seeing if they live on TikTok? And and this person who was like a generally like not a anti-Biden, this is a, a, a curious person who wondered what, why is there this youth, the, the Gen Z problem? Like just like, well, let's go look at TikTok and really dive in there. Spend a week on TikTok and just look for all the Biden content you could. Not political content from campaigns or operatives, but just the normal shit that people are making. And he's like, it is fucking merciless. It's a, a, a merciless. Well, it's a lot of Gaza. Yes, but, but yeah, yes, yeah. but but it's like it's like there's nothing positive. I mean, it's like it's a no, nonstop no. flood of of mockery and criticism. And again, I'm not pointing at any finger. I'm just I'm just raising the fact that that's out there. It's not like you know, it's not like it's not already there. You know, people are seeing a lot of stuff that's negative the biggest thing. Like the people that like that are outside of the campaign that are raise money and worry about you know what's happening on the outside the biggest this is the biggest hole that everybody obsesses over is yes. what do you do about tiktok okay one rapid fire then a final circus question my rapid fire right now today percent chance joe biden donald trump other are taking the oath of office next january yeah. <laughs> we have to do percentages too percent. we can't just say biden i can i can go first i'm like 57 biden 42 trump one other 
Wow. That's I'm 53, very bullish Biden. On, it's really bullish on Biden. Jesus. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, You're lower than 53? Well, I'm 53. Uh, yeah. 50, I'm 53 Biden. I'm like, I think that the... I'm like 49, 46. Uh, yeah. 49, 46, 5. Yeah. Because one, cause, cause one of them could die. I'm 48, yeah. 46, 6. Well, we're not going to have being boring then in the fall. So we're gonna have a much better epi- we're not we'll have a much better episode theme song in the fall. If we, I think that uh, in the fall the stake the stake you know this everybody says this and they are covering the primary or being out there in the world you're like but the stakes are so high and people are like yeah I know the stakes are high but right now we're we're going through this part which is like the annoying you know Trump will get his get to twelve fifteen you know in the middle of March and by the time we get to the fall the stakes even though people are not psyched about the choice and a lot of people are like not loving the the two nominees the stakes will kick in at that point i think it will suddenly be able to start to feel more urgent uh, a lot more urgent all right the the song is not sweet caroline (laughs) not sweet circus (laughs) circus things i I want one thing for something you miss being out there or a memory something people should search for on youtube a a favorite circus moment you know, here's here's one small thing that I would search for on YouTube that I think that the Biden campaign should look for, uh, should use as an ad. <laughs> uh, our um, Ukraine episode. No, I'm sorry. Look at me. Look at my mind slipping. Our Israel Gaza episode where he went to Israel and at the beginning, uh, Divya Chungi, who uh, was the head editor of the show, uh, her team did this cold open that was Biden through the years. And I think it started with like him meeting, um, you know, um, Jesus, uh, no, Moses. Jesus, no, um, uh, Moses, Indira Gandhi, Moses, <laughs> you know, as, as a young senator meeting Indira Gandhi yeah. in Israel. And it like went through the entire, you know, for his 50 year career through a foreign policy lens and all the world leaders he's met with and all the situations he's been in. And then when you arrive to the present, you're like, of course he's the guy. Um, and that was, so that was uh winter of, no, that was most recently. That was fall of uh, 20, uh, 23, the Israel episode. I miss the extreme balance and polar opposites of being at the Kremlin watching John take on a, a KGB uh, <laughs> super operative and and just, I mean, seeing the best at their craft going at it, uh, juxtaposed with being in a county fair in Marjorie Taylor Greene's district watching something being shot out of a cannon. Oh, my God. <laughs> Did you see the January 6th pinball? We also missed CPAC. I had some CPAC clips we didn't get to, but uh, that could have also been in this week's episode. Uh, there was a January 6th pinball at CPAC this week. It's, uh, you know, it's devolving. Heilman, fin- last thoughts, memories, words of wisdom? I miss um, I miss uh, Jen's uh, dark and foreboding uh, apocalyptic view of the world, which uh, always reminds me there's someone who thinks things are more fucked even than me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, Tim, I miss your fashion sense. The, the pearls, uh, oh, having a routine access to pearls on boys. Uh, the pearl necklaces are, your pearl necklaces are top of the line. And, it, and it, the common thing to say would be to say that they miss MCAT's hats, but I don't miss MCAT's hats. I miss MCAT's hat boxes. No one <laughs> knows what it's like to be on the road with Mark McKinnon, where all these hats have to be carried around in their own pieces of, of suitcase. They're, each one has an individual suitcase. That like is, was like, that MCAT was goes to Moscow and I'm like, the, all of the overhead bins are filled with these Stetson box, hat boxes. I'm like, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Uh, but I do miss that. This is like, what was the Gene Hackman character and the, uh, oh man, I'm going to miss it. Go ahead, Jen, pull it up. What were you going to say? No, no, no. I was, no, I was just going to say, th- speaking of CPAC, it's just, uh, I just have to do a shout out for No Peace Bitch. <laughs> no <laughs> Peace <laughs> Bitch. Megan McCain. <laughs> I'm doing her podcast next oh week. My God. Oh, you are? Yeah. Well, just She's send like her getting- our regards. Getting some revenge from Carrie Le- for on behalf of Tim Miller, Carrie Lake. Oh my God! No, maybe that peace, should have been the bitch. episode title. No peace, bitches, <laughs> guys. God. Jen Palmieri, Mark McKinnon, John Heilman. <laughs> thank you for doing this. I hope to see you Pleasure. guys this summer in the fall, and uh, we'll talk it. to y'all soon. Kick right. it, y'all. Bye. Later days.